Welcome back to Gale Force Winds Season 4. The Gale Force Winds Podcast is proudly sponsored by the Newfoundland and Labrador Construction Association. The NLCA provides unparalleled opportunities for its members through industry education, construction information, government advocacy, and networking events. The NLCA is building Newfoundland and Labrador. For more information, visit nlca.ca. Well, folks, welcome back to Gale Force Winds. I'm here today with someone that I actually uh, saw online. I saw a bunch of posts. One of the things about Gale Force Winds is we don't do very much research on our guests, and we do that intentionally. I want to sit here and discover Jason just as much as you do. So when we're going through the questions and he tells us a little bit about himself, we get an understanding from him of what his journey's been like and what, what, what's making him tick. So that's a little bit of background about the way we do things. I'm here in my home studio. i uh, been gone away for a couple of weeks. Uh, it was a warm climb and Jason asked me how I was doing. I said, well, a little bit of a struggle now back into the winter, but there it is. But without any further ado, I am here with Jason Stock and I'd like you, Jason, to introduce yourself and let's weave a conversation. Yeah, sounds good. I'm glad you're back from the Turks and Caicos. <laughs> but uh, yeah, my name's Jason Stock. Um, I am in the Saint, local St. John's uh, tech community. I uh, work for a company called PolyUnity Tech uh, in a sales and customer support capacity. And uh, yeah, like I've, I've been in that community for about 10 years. And I'm also uh, on you know, the path where I'm discovering myself through some self-improvement stuff. And when I post online, sometimes I'm talking about uh, PolyUnity and the fantastic, wonderful world of 3D printing, and sometimes I'm talking about some more interesting topics, uh, you could say, such as like sobriety and what those kind of journeys are look, look like. Uh, so yeah, that's a little bit about me. Once we get into that, some people have said to me, you know, don't get preachy. That's not what we're going to get into here today. We're just going to talk about our experience. But I'd like to back it up a little bit. Um, I understand, and it's about your journey. So you came from the United States. Tell us a little bit about where you grew up and then how you ended up in this uh, beautiful place we call Newfoundland. Yeah, I mean, I, I often joke that I have like an immigrant story. Yep. Um, and, uh, you know, we moved to Newfoundland in 2011 with six suitcases, two kids, and about 5,000 bucks. And, um, uh, you know, started to build a life for ourselves. My wife uh, grew up in a small town called uh, Greens Harbor, which is about 75 minutes from St. John's. And uh, when our kids were like five and one, we decided that we wanted to raise them in Newfoundland. and went through the process to, to kind of come here. Uh, I grew up in a small town um, in upstate New York. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, the town's called Oswego, New York. It's right on Lake Ontario. If you could look all the way across the lake, you'd see Toronto. And um, yeah, like it, it was, it, it was an interesting uh, experience growing up uh, in the States and experiencing that and then you know, coming to Canada, so yeah. Did you have uh, any background, like your, your parents in, in the business world at all, sales, de business development, anything like that? No, my, my, my parents were both nurses, um, and uh, th we all often joke that the healthcare was the family business mm -hmm. because, um, you know, everyone was involved in the hospital in some way, shape, or form. Uh, I was never uh, quite academically inclined uh, growing up, and, um, you know, I, I, I'm really open and transparent in that when we moved to, to Newfoundland, I had to list every address and every job that I ever had. And there was a lot of addresses and there was a lot of jobs. And uh, part of that was because of the, uh, the substance abuse issues. And part of it was just, you know, I hadn't quite find my, found my thing yet. And um, so sales became that thing for me that, um, I, I started to build on and develop and you know I went worked a lot of retail jobs I worked a lot of commission only jobs and uh, it, but it wasn't until um, I moved to Newfoundland where I got my first I guess what you would call like professional sales job um, so it was a journeyman for a long time 
Interesting. So you just threw a lot at us. Um, uh, growing up in the United States, do you think there was a business orientation around that, despite the fact that your parents are nurses? Was there any influence that kind of pushed you into that? Or is it the, because um, uh, I was in sales for 35 years myself with no one in my life that had any business background at all. But I think the freedom of being able to navigate on my own and not have a supervisor breathing down my neck all the time gave me a lot of freedom. I think that's why I gravitated towards it, despite the fact I also really enjoyed customer service and making customers happy. So what, what gave you that impetus to be a sales and business development guy? <laughs> it, it was almost by accident, to be honest with you, because um, I spent some time living in New York City and did all kinds of jobs there. Like, you know, I worked for UPS as a truckloader. Yeah. I worked at the Gap as a security guard. I, I worked all these different types of jobs. And most of the jobs that I had were hourly. Uh, but then when I got my first sales job, uh, you know, somebody said, well, you know, we'll, we'll pay you a little bit hourly, but then if you sell something, you make some extra money. And I was pretty enticed by that. Because, Were you in what, like Manhattan at this point, or yeah, 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 like, and and uh, you know, I started, I started, you know, uh, uh, in gym membership sales and personal training sales and all these different types of environments where, um, you know, if you sold something, you got a little bit of something on the back end. And for somebody like me that that didn't have like a great educational pedigree, it became this opportunity for me to go out and show that I could produce something and uh, and make a, a decent living and um, you know that it was it was really understanding that that kind of led me down the road of, of sales and uh, into what eventually became a really great career. Um, got to you know ask you a few questions around business in New York, being a Newfoundlander, yeah, I've traveled around Canada a lot, but I've never done business in the United States. And in particular, I can only think as you were telling me, you know, what it must be like to sell gym memberships in downtown New York. Like, there's so much coming at a person who lives in New York and you're just trying to get in and close a deal with them. Tell us a little bit about what that experience was like. Yeah, I mean, New York's a bit of a pressure cooker. And, you know, my, my 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 um oh, I'll, I'll tell you a li little bit about new york like new york is w was one of those places where um when i was living there somebody came to me and said why are you here and i didn't have a really good reason i was just coming off a bad relationship and like i wasn't trying to make it and, and become an actor i wasn't trying to do anything specific and they said to me jason like you don't have a reason for being here you gotta get out because this city's gonna eat you alive. <laughs> Interesting. And, uh, and, and, and I, I actually did decide to, to leave because there wasn't a great purpose for me being there. And which kind of leads to, um, you know, maybe it's okay if I tell you a story. Sure. So my uh, f friend and I were living in Philadelphia. You're gonna start to notice a progression south. Um, and I was selling fitness equipment, and I really wasn't particularly happy with my job, um, just getting by. And my friend came in to me, and he said, man, you know, let's go to breakfast this morning. Cool. You're in Philadelphia. We're in Philadelphia. Go to breakfast. So we sit down, and, you know, through this conversation, you know, we say, where are we going to go to breakfast? He says, let's go to IHOP. International House of Pancakes for people been who haven't there. been there before. Been there, yeah. They're really good, <laughs> really good pancakes. Yes. So we go and we sit down, and the waitress, having a very bad day, very bad, she actually winds up quitting her job. Heated conversation with her and the manager. Me and my friend are sitting down, we're having coffee, we're watching this whole thing unfold. I look at him and I'm like, Brian, I'm so captivated by what's going on here. I'm, I'm inspired by her because she's miserable in this, it, this mm, job. Yeah. It's not leading her anywhere. She just decided to pack it in. She's gone. She left. So he was like, maybe you should do the same thing. So later on that afternoon, I went into my job. And what was your job at that point? Selling fitness equipment, yep. slinging treadmills, and I quit. 
Later on the next day, we had all of my gear packed, our lives packed into a tiny Toyota to sell. We were heading south on I-95. Married? You weren't married at this point. Not married at this no. time. Leading there. Okay. Heading south on I-95. Yep. And uh, eventually we end up in Atlanta, Georgia. And we landed on the doorstep of the Salvation Army College for Officer Training, which is where my friend's aunt lived. And she took us in and let us stay there for a little while while we figured stuff out. And she said, boys, like, you got to figure out something to do because you just can't be vagabonds. And she got us jobs at summer camp. And uh, eventually that is where I met my beautiful wife. Uh, and that's how eventually we got back to Newfoundland. So it's funny mm -hmm. how your life can change on a dime. You know, had we not had breakfast at IHOP that morning, maybe I don't quit my job that day. Maybe we don't go south. Maybe we never work at summer camp. Maybe I never meet my wife. Interesting. Yeah. But not everyone would go from breakfast, watching someone quit their job, to actually taking that action themselves. I was also an irresponsible alcoholic. Okay. <laughs> so that factored into your decision. Sure, of course. I wasn't making great decisions. Right. I didn't make great decisions until I was 40. Yeah, yeah. Interesting, eh? Someone said to me, and we'll get into this about alcohol, but uh, I watched a video, and I can't remember who it was, but it said it's something like 85% of all crime has, maybe it's 85 or 90%, alcohol is behind it. And then he went on to talk about decisions and poor decisions. And uh, it's interesting, I was talking to someone the other day who quit alcohol, and we'll get into this in a minute, but they said if they reflect on their lives, every bad decision they make had alcohol as part of it. So we'll, we'll dig into that again in a minute. But so let's, let's talk a little bit about that, that beautiful woman that you met. So you, you, you left, you go, where was it again? You, you went to the, uh, in Georgia, you met, met her? Yeah, we, we, we eventually got jobs at a Salvation Army summer camp. The camp was in Denton, North Carolina. And uh, you know, like I always tell people, like I was, I was at camp, I, they gave, because I was older, I got the head counselor job. At golf cart, so I had to pick of the best, best, uh, best of the best for, from the ladies' perspective. So you're at a Salvation Army camp. Did they know your background with alcohol, uh, or no. did you hide that? Oh yeah, we 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 100% hid that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you're there, and you are starting to see people that are not associated with alcohol, and and you get to see what their lives are like. Is this yeah. am I going? down the right road here? Yeah, I mean, it was interesting. I mean, there was, there was a whole bunch of people that I was interacting with that were, um, that were way different than me. And so, in a lot of ways, their, their lives were a lot better. And, um, you know, unfortunately for me, it took another 15 years for me to get to the place where I was actually ready to put it down. Yeah. But um, that was probably like the beginning where I started to see some some people that were living differently and um but yeah i'm really grateful for the fact that uh despite the fact that i wasn't making great choices um it, it, it still sort of conspired for 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 good for me because you know, i always tell people like meeting kathy meeting my wife was the best thing that ever happened to me and um yeah, had I not taken that road trip, that unexpected road trip, even though at the time, looking back, it probably wasn't a great decision, yeah. I never would have met her. Yeah. So you're, how old are you at this point? You're in Georgia and you're... Probably 26. Wow, you're still pretty young. Still pretty young, yeah. Yeah. So then you're in Georgia, you meet Kathy, and you spend how long in Georgia? We, um, we met and um, we dated long distance for a year. And uh, then we decided to get married. Um, you know, that was a tough conversation <laughs> with a lot of people. There was a lot of people betting that we wouldn't last. And there was a lot of reasons why a lot of them were probably pretty, pretty right on why, why it shouldn't have lasted. Yeah. And um, the next year we got married and um, we, we, she came to the States and we, uh, we started to uh, build a life together. And, um, we, we were living in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina at the time, and I had taken a job, sales job, and she was doing some work with the church, and uh, not too long after that, after that, we had our first child, and 
a couple years after that, we had our second, and yeah. Tell us about that. I know for me, when my first child was born, it was it was a pretty transformative time in my life, and I couldn't get over it. The miracle of birth. Tell us a little bit about that, Jason. I was not ready for it. Hmm. They say you're never ready. Yeah. But you know, it, it, fatherhood didn't come naturally to me. Um, it was a, a learned skill as much as anything else. And by no means have I been a, you know, a perfect father. But if I look back, my oldest son now is almost 18. He'll be 18 in like 16 days. And um, you know, I, th I, think, I think that I never understood exactly how much I could love another human being until he came into the world. And every day, I, I, you know, I, I grew to love my kids a little bit more and a little bit deeper and a little bit differently. And, um, you know, they, they have helped me just as much as I've helped them on, on this journey through life. And, um, but yeah, like it, I, I remember like, you know, when, when, when my son was first born, I like, I didn't know how to do anything. I didn't even know how to put the damn car seat in. Well, I don't know if anyone did. So, so I got uh, the RCMP helped me with that. Actually, my good friend showed me how to put it in there because yeah. they do the training on that. Yeah. No. No. It was uh, so we were ill prepared. It was uh, it was on the job learning for sure. Yeah. So um, you have two children. What are their names? Caden and Preston. And they're eighteen and almost fourteen. Wow. Yeah. I have a twenty year old and a sixteen year old, and I'm a lot older than you, but. Uh, I was much older when I started with, with the kids, but I, I think what I find is that you start to reflect a little bit and you say to yourself, you know, I need to show a better example. And for me, that's part of the reason why that I, I gave up alcohol and I, we can delve into it a little bit. I always joke that, you know, I'm not that smart because I was 49 before I decided. I had enough of this. This is not working for me, you know? And as I got older, Jason, and I, I broke this finger playing hockey, if I had a glass of wine the night before, I'd wake up in the morning, and then I'm like, oh yeah, I had a glass of wine last night. And I could hardly pry my hands open. I don't know, someone said the sulfides get into your knuckles and all that. But I was getting a bit of that going on, and it's like, this is not helping me. So I stopped. So I'm going to ask you this, uh, you know, how long has it been for you since you stopped? For me, it was 2015. I have not had a single drink um, since then. Yeah, January 11th, 2018 is my sobriety date. Yeah. So six years and, you know, a few months now. You know, again, if anyone feels that we're preaching, frankly, you can turn this off, <laughs> but I'm going to go, uh, and this is a thing that I found interesting about you. You posted this on LinkedIn and went very public with it, and I've been following you ever since. Uh, I don't talk very much about sobriety, and you know, someone said to me one time, oh my God, I didn't know Jerry Crew was a raving alcoholic. Well, I wouldn't consider myself that. I can certainly consider myself really enjoying alcohol, and I think what's going on in, the, in our society right now that it's so prevalent that people need to rein it in a little bit. Now, maybe I'm getting a little preachy, but all I can tell you, Jason, from my perspective, my life in the last, what, 2015, is almost nine years, which is amazing how quickly it goes. I don't miss it. And my life has been enhanced dramatically because it's no longer there. Tell us a little bit about how your life has been without alcohol in your life. Yeah, I think, I think for me to tell that story, I need to just rewind a little bit yep. and explain what it was like when I was drinking. And, um, you know, for, for me, I, I had a problem with alcohol, but it wasn't just alcohol. Alcohol was, um, that was a symptom of a, a much deeper problem, a much deeper thing that I needed to address. And what, what I really had was uh, a shame problem. And I had very low self-esteem. I had um, really built my life on a foundation of lies. And the lying served me when I was a small child and, uh, uh, and, and I took it with me into adulthood. And it's one of those things that, you know, nobody wants to be characterized as a liar. No. It feels even dirty even saying it or even talking about it. 
but I had built up a shell around my life and lies had become the foundation for that and alcohol was the thing that I was using most frequently in order to numb and deal with all of the pain and all of the bad feelings that were associated with the way that I had been constructing and building my life. And so um, for me, um, it took a long time to come and acknowledge. I never liked the word alcoholic. I sat in a meeting many times before I actually decided to actually really make a change. And I, I'd always leave those meetings saying, I'm not quite like them. Um, and then, you know, things would get worse. Um, but really, my, my life was built on like a, a really poor foundation. And for me, there was an implosion event that happened early 2018. Um, all of the decisions that I had been making up into that point were starting to catch up with me. All the lies all the deception, all the hidden truths uh, were, were coming to the surface and I could no longer hold everything together. Um, wow. I was unsafe. I was drinking and driving. I was doing things that were uh, putting myself, my family at risk. Um, my marriage was destroyed. Um, I had gotten to this place where the walls were cracking around my world and I could no longer move forward. And uh, I required a lot of help in order to get out of that dark space. And I, I always tell people too that um, in January 2018, there was an implosion event. My marriage ended. Now I'm still married to my wife, but it's a new marriage because we could no longer move forward uh, based on things that had happened in the past. We had to, to develop a brand new foundation that required sobriety. And I remember she told me, she said, Jason, one more drink, one more lie, we're done. And I thought to myself, maybe, just maybe, I could not drink. But could I really be honest? Hmm. That scared me because I didn't know if I could wow. because I had been lying for so long. Yeah. It had been the way that I operated. And um, so I decided to get help. And for me, that looked like um, going away. Um, I spent every last dollar that I had um, and, and I went to rehab for 90 days. 90? 90 days. Um, I actually flew uh, to the States. Um, we found a rehab center that I could afford in Oklahoma. And I checked myself in and I stayed there for 90 days. Uh, and I started to unpack the utter, complete destruction that was my life. And I started to try to understand how could I move forward? Did I want to even move forward? Yeah, yeah. And when I came home, um, I started going to meetings and I went to thousands of hours of sobriety support meetings in order to eventually get me to a place where I could even reconcile the concept of the term recovery. Um, and so that's why it sometimes is difficult for me when people say things like, you know, is it going to be hard? Yeah, it's going to be hard. Like, what is what what needs to change? Everything. Um, but what I got on the back end, and what's new, is that my wife and I have this beautiful relationship, and it's special because when somebody has seen you in your darkness, 
and they're able to help you move through your shame and become a better person. And you are able to sit with that and learn how to be honest with a person like that. What you get on the back end is something that's really, really special. And our marriage today is better than I ever thought it could be. And in many ways, I don't deserve it. Um, but that's some of that. Remember I said it all started with shame. Shame is believing that I'm a bad person. Not that I did bad things. And that was one of the big shifts that I learned in recovery. Mm -hmm. um, is, is that I did a lot of bad things. I made a lot of bad choices. Um, I did a lot of things that I wish I could take back. But it didn't make me a bad person. And once I understood that, and once I understood that there was something inside of me that was worth salvaging, then I was able to start to understand what recovery was going to be like. And in the beginning, it was like I was gripping onto a roller coaster. Not drinking every day was the only thing I could think about. I never thought I would have a day where I didn't think about alcohol. I thought it was going to be a dogfight. 24 hours a day, seven days a week for the rest of my life. And I believed that I could be sober, but I thought it was going to be misery forever. What I didn't understand is that if I invested in recovery and I did some of the things that I was told to do in recovery, I would eventually get a life where there was freedom, where I didn't think about alcohol every day and I could be out somewhere and I could see it and not be affected by it. And that my friend is special. And it's something that I never thought that I would receive. And it's one of the most powerful things I've ever experienced. Jason, you know, we've done, we've interviewed probably 900 people in the last three years. And I have never heard anyone describe their life like you just did. And it's, it's gripping. Uh, there's so many questions asked, but I do have one question around the, uh, 90 days at what point into your um, into that did you feel like you may be successful in getting through it was there ever a point early on or did it come on the 89th day talk a little bit about how that unfolded for you yeah um i mean i have to tell a story um and we'll, we'll do a trigger warning Okay. Uh, for anyone who's listening, about 35 days into my treatment, um, I was having a real hard time. And I was not working. I had stopped participating in group sharing sessions. I had um, lost um, any drive to move forward because I didn't believe that there was going to be a, a life worth reclaiming. I thought it was over. And I started to have suicidal ideations. And um, I, I remember um, I, had, I had started to write out uh, some goodbye letters. And I was starting to make plans for how I was going to exit the world. And I was laying on the couch. I had tears coming down my eyes. And there was a counselor, her name's Kelly. And she stood over me like an ogre. And she said, get the fuck up. Wow. And it jarred me because I did not expect that. And she was very harsh with me. And she said, I need to explain to you the reality of what you're dealing with. She said, you're going to make a choice and you're going to choose whether you're going to live or you're going to die, but you're going to understand what you're choosing. And you're going to understand that if you choose option number two and you choose to take your life, here's what it's going to do to your kids. Here's what it's going to do to your wife. Here's the wreckage that you're going to leave behind. Are you going to add to that? Mm -hmm. And then I had some counseling, some things that were less harsh 
to work me through a place where I could work through all of those feelings and emotions. And then I met with my group, 35 men in this facility together to get healthy. And I stood up in front of those guys and I said, guys, I'm sorry. I haven't been a good member of the community the last few days. Here's what I've been going through. Here's my goodbye letters. I'm burn them. I went outside. And I remember one of the guys took the letters, took his lighter, started burning it. And, and then he's not a religious guy. But he said, our father who art in heaven, every voice went through that prayer. And we watched those letters burn. And through that burning of that pain, there became a new birth, a new willingness to live, and a belief that I was worthy of saving. And that was about day 40. And from that point forward, I put everything that I had into this quest, this idea that I could be something different. But it was that moment that changed it all. You know, when you ask questions, you never know what the response is going to be, but uh, that was intense. And, and I appreciate you sharing it. So before we hit record, you said to me that you want to do something, and it, stop me if I'm jumping too quickly off this topic, but you want to be something more to the people around you, and particularly men. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? I've been given a gift in that I believe that everything that I've gone through and everything that I've learned in sobriety has been for my good. And I believe that pain can be recycled into beauty. That's one of the things that I've learned in sobriety. I think that there are a lot of men out in the world who are dealing with their own lies, their own shame, their own deception. Um, and it's not always alcohol. No. In the world that we live in today, it can be video games, it can be porn, it can be whatever. Um, marijuana, alcohol, drugs, like you name it. Everyone's vice is different. Yeah. But it all covers the same stuff. And I think um, it's very difficult for men to come to terms with the fact that they have a, a shame problem, that they're covering up these things. And I believe that when I got sober, every step of the way I was given a guide from the moment that I decided that I was going to get sober, the right person was in the right place every step along the way. And they always appeared when they needed to appear. And sometimes they were there for a short time. Sometimes they were there for a long time. And the role that I want to be able to play in other men's life is to be that guide to be somebody who's sat in darkness, who has changed, who has overcome, who has put down the things that were hurting me. And now what I want to be able to do is go back into the darkness with people on purpose, to sit there with them, to hear them in their darkness and to help guide them towards a better life a better path, a path of meaning and freedom, and ultimately 
if I can help one person find freedom from the things that are keeping them in bondage and in shame, then everything that I've gone through is worth it. I'm going to ask you this. Um, thanks, by the way, for sharing this. Um, it's not easy for anyone to share their deep, deepest, darkest uh, challenges. And I think you've really delved into this today. If there's, not if, there's people watching that are going to wonder what they can do, what steps can they take? And I think let's, let's delve into that a little bit, you know. What, I mean, you know, this is obviously not an overnight thing for you. I mean, you were 40 days into rehab. Someone who's not out there in rehab and having all that support system around them, what steps, what pieces of advice would you give them to try and move towards where you are now? Yeah, I, I, I would say um, there's a couple of things. Number one, we all know the answers. Right, like yeah. before I ever went to rehab for weeks and weeks, even years, I would Google, Am I an alcoholic? Right, like I'm putting this in, I'm expecting Google to tell me <laughs> like the answer to this question, and I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm looking for reasons and rationalizations for why I'm not. So then, then you know, I, I was also asking questions like. Is it bad enough to stop? Um, and I realized that the questions that I was asking were poor. And had I asked myself the question, am I free? That would have been a different question. That would have been a different answer. And, and I, think, I think that being willing to explore the questions that you need to ask yourself in order to change uh, is important and everybody has to determine what their own level of comfort is and how much they're willing to step outside of that in order to change and the last thing that I'll say and it's the last story um, is that there are certain principles that you can learn to live by that can help you walk through these types of things. And uh, one of the nights uh, in Oklahoma, I met a man named Snake. He looks exactly like you would picture him to look. He's 60 years old, eye patch, African American gentleman weathered, been through it, years and years in prison, now out, running a narcotics anonymous program, pulling people out of the mud. That's who this guy was. I don't know what his real name is. His name was Snake. So he got up in front of the group one day and he said, gentlemen, so when you decide to change something big in your life like sobriety, it's going to feel like there's a thousand pieces of shit swirling around over your head. And your initial inclination is going to be to clean it all up as fast as you can. And he said, if you do that, I promise you the only thing you're going to get is a mess. So he said, what you need to do is this. Is you need to take one piece of shit. The smallest one that you can find and you need to clean that up and then you need to go back the next day and you need to pull the next one and you need to pull it down and you need to clean that up and he said if you do that before you know it little by little you will get to a place where you look over your head and there's no more shit and it might take years, but it's worth it. And the way that you do that is you just do the next right thing. Not the next thing right. Big difference. The next right thing 
means that you pick the next thing that you can do that's in front of you. It needs to be small enough that you can do it and you will do it and you do that thing. And then you rinse, wash, and repeat. And if you can do that, you can transform your life and you can recover from anything. Jason, wow, that's an incredible piece of advice. Um, I'm going to continue to ask you more questions because as you talk, more things come to mind. I sense that there's a lot more challenges with mental health, primarily because of the pandemic. You're, you were a couple of years ahead of that. Do you think the timing was good for you or did you also have some real challenges in the pandemic that tested you? Would that be accurate? Yeah, the pandemic was a real interesting time for me and it was scary because my foundation got challenged and yeah. it got shook. And the reason it got shook is because I used to go to in-person AA meetings every day those closed down. Shit. Never even thought of that. Yeah. Those closed down. So what we're we gonna do? We're gonna meet online. I had to find I had to find new ways in order to get the goodness and information that I needed uh, in order to be able to continue my recovery. And an interesting thing happened in that is um, my wife gave me a book an audio book. I was listening to it one day in the early pandemic. And it was called We Are the Luckiest. It's written by a woman named Laura McCowan. And it floored me because she had my affliction. And she said she was the, we're, we are the luckiest. And what she was getting by that is that the things that she learned in getting sober were so valuable, so life-changing, that she was lucky to have found them. And she started a sobriety support group called TLC, The Luckiest Club. Nice. And I joined it. And it was a group of Hundreds eventually became thousands of people across the world who came together to talk about their struggles and sobriety as the world shut down. The group was mostly women. Um, and it was one of the first times in my life that I had ever had successful relationships with women outside of my wife where I acted above board honestly and appropriately. That was a big win. And I had built an exterior of toughness around my world, an armor, if you will, um, where I, I had become rough. I was rough around the edges. And what this group did for me is they helped soften my heart a little bit. And they helped me learn some really interesting truths that helped shape my life forever. And I remember I was sitting in a car on a meeting. That's what I would do, I'd go to Tim Hortons, I'd get a coffee and I would turn on a meeting and I would listen to it in the car and I would share in the car. My recovery happened in the car. So much to the point where they would call me Car Jason. And I don't remember what the reading was this one particular day, but there was a day where there was a reading and it particularly touched my heart and then the shares were all directly interesting and relevant to what I was trying to do. And the TLC had nine things that they live by for recovery, kind of like the 12 steps. Number eight was you are loved. I had a hard time with that one because remember the driver to my addiction was shame. People who struggle with shame have a hard time believing that they're worthy of love, especially when they've done really bad things, which I had done. But I remember that moment in that car that day where all of a sudden it clicked and I really believed 
that I was worthy of love. And I also believe that understanding that truth needed to happen in order for me to live fully with my family and life and in sobriety because my wife had forgiven me. My wife had moved on. I hadn't. I was still carrying the boxing gloves. I was still beating myself up. I was the one who was keeping us from getting as close as we could get because I had all of the shame that was still undealt with. And man, I'm telling you, when that happened and I, I believed that I was loved and I was worthy of love and that I could put the boxing gloves down and I could start to work on letting go of the shame, that's when the real growth happened. That's when I went from white knuckling it, trying not to drink every day, to exploring freedom and sobriety. Because through love, I found freedom. You reminded me of a word that uh, I want you to explore a little bit, and that word is stigma. I'm going to give you an example. My mom was 43 when my dad died, and uh, the first counseling that she agreed to was two weeks before her death when she was 85 years old. So she was 43 when my father died, and I always knew she needed some sort of grief counseling. She would not do it. Nobody wanted, you know, in that generation in particular, you do not want to have that stigma, I guess is the word. Well, we did some counseling two weeks later, she passed away. I'll be honest with you, I found it probably more beneficial than she did. But tell me a little bit about that word and what that means. Was that addressed in the, uh, in, in, you know, in the 90 days that you did? Tell me a little bit about what that means and how, if in fact, you know, it's a challenge, how do you overcome it? Yeah, well, I mean, I think for years and years and years, well, the AA program, um, which is very successful, um, has a lot of people um, meeting in church basements um, under the veil of anonymity for a very good reason, because there is a stigma, right? Um, and uh, that's changing a little bit. Um, but I remember that word alcoholic felt like poison in my mouth. Mm. I did not like that word and I did not like the stigma that came with it. But eventually I made friends with it. And I realized that, you know, one of the things that they say in meetings is it's not what you drank. It's not how much you drank. It's how it affected you when you drank. And for me, I had developed a very unhealthy relationship with alcohol the definitions of alcoholic fit and um and then i i was like you know what i am I'm, I'm just not going to be ashamed of this because uh if i had any other disease or infliction um or mental health disorder um there there wouldn't be an issue around that and there there are thousands and thousands of people that if they ingest a drink, it changes them on a biological and chemical level and they become different people and they make different choices. Mm. And um, there's a whole number of different reasons for that. Um, and so part of, part of the way that I combat shame and stigma is it can't exist when you put it into the light. And I knew that people couldn't point and laugh at me behind my back or make judgments behind my back if I just said it out loud and on purpose. So it was my own survival mechanism to be public and upfront and out in the open. And it worked out for me. I'm not saying that that's everyone's path. There are some people that may never want to become public with these types of things and that's their choice and that's okay. Yeah. Not everybody needs to be public about these types of things. Uh, but the reason that I'm public is that I believe that there, there are people that are like me that are out there that are listening to things like this 
and they need to hear the stories um, of other people that have gone through what they're going through. And if they go to the rooms of AA or NA, they're going to hear those stories. But some people never make it into those rooms. They never, they never, they never cross the threshold, and they die before they get there. Or they make it in and they don't change and they go out and they die. Because the one thing that's true about this disease of addiction is that um, once you've crossed the line from drinking was fun to it was fun with some problems to it was problems with some fun, once you hit the line where it's all problems, there ain't no going back. Yeah. And from there, there's three places that it goes. It's jails, institutions, and death. And people need to understand that reality. That if you've gotten to the place where, where that, uh, that alcohol has you by the throat like that, that's where it goes. And, and so that's why I think talking about these things and bringing it out into the light and removing the shame from it is important. Well, you know, part of the reason we, we actually met for the first time at the Tech NL thing. And after you said to me, I have some more to say. And I got a sense that it was what we're talking about right now. And I'm telling you, Jason, I really appreciate you coming on here. Hopefully, the people that need this conversation that happen to be following Gale Force Winds have stayed with this. We're about 50 minutes into this now, and you know, my concern is that the moment you start talking about sobriety, people tune out. But I guess they need to be ready, don't they? You know? Yeah, well, I, you know, uh, what, I, what I've learned too is that this is a family disease. You know, everyone has a drunk uncle that comes yeah. to Thanksgiving every year and, you know, <laughs> makes, makes a, a fool of himself. And I don't know anybody. Who, who isn't in one way, shape, or form had, had, have been affected by addiction at some point. And one thing that the pandemic did is it raised our levels of drinking and consumption um, because we were all stuck at home, we're drinking more. And unfortunately, with a lot of people, bad things happen when you start increasing the volume of alcohol and it's hard to go back. Yeah, And so, Although this message isn't for everybody, uh, and it may not be alcohol, but I, I truly believe everybody has a thing. Everybody has a thing that has gnawed at them and has made their life less than it could be. And if it's not alcohol, it could be something else. And my hope is that some of the lessons that I've learned in sobriety and recovery that have helped me get sober can help people in all walks of life, whether they've dealt with addiction or not. Yeah. The concept of doing the next right thing, I think, could be applicable in business, could be applicable in lots of different areas of life that have nothing to do with addiction. And that that's one of the reasons why um, I want to do things like this, so that other people can get the wisdom and knowledge that I was so lucky to be able to acquire in recovery. Well, I think, you know, what I, my experience in business is that when you're so passionate about a particular concept, um, I, I've always been passionate about business development. I was passionate about the communications industry, newspapers, radio. I think business people in particular and entrepreneurs have a tendency to addiction. And frankly, to make business successful, you've almost got to be addicted to it because there's times that I've sat in this room, Jason, I said to you, I've edited for 20 hours straight and not even realized it. That is a bit of an addiction. Now, that's partly why people in business become successful. But my gut tells me there's a lot of people that listen and watch Gale Force Winds that probably need this message. And I think it's incredibly important that you are willing to make this public. Um, what I will I kind of laugh at is that you're a business development guy, I'm a business development guy, and man, I love talking business development. 
But you know what? We've gone on about it, about you know a very important topic. It's it's what I laugh at is that we never even talked about business development. But I tell you, what I'd like is for you to come back and maybe we'll delve into that a little bit because your business development in a startup, which is a whole other interesting world. Let's let's do something. Let's let's give you the floor and say you know. Let's summarize what we've talked about here today. Uh, you've kind of summarized it in many ways and given advice and everything, but let's let's just, you know, in parting, what is it you'd like to say to everyone? I think I view myself as one of the luckiest people on the planet because I've been given the gift of learning all of these lessons and being able to change a life that so desperately needed to be changed. And on the back end of that came so much beauty and so many positive relationships. And I would just say to anyone who's listening, if there is a thing that you are dealing with in your life that is causing darkness, that is a contributor to shame, that is affecting your self-esteem, and you are actively doing something that is hurting you, and you're saying to yourself, I don't know how to stop this thing. I'm here to tell you that if you have the willingness and capability to be brave and to be honest, if I can change, you can change too. Well, folks, this is Jason Stock, and he has gone on quite a journey. And I tell you, the truth that he's told here today has, uh, has made me feel humbled. When we started Gale Force Winds, I had no idea we would be into a conversation like this. But I can tell you it's been very helpful to me, and I hope it's helpful to you. And as Alan likes to say, the world needs more Jason Stock. Jason, thank you, my friend. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in to Gale Force Winds. That's Gale Force Winds. WINS.com.